one of the nicest pieces besides this piece that I've seen is one of the pers- people rolled it up and created like a, like a tube and right. looked through the tube and said, I can see light at the end of the tunnel. Wow. Welcome, friends, to the third season of Heart to Heart with Michael, a program for the bereaved community. Our purpose is to empower members of our community. This season, we're taking a longer view of grief. Can we find healing? Can we find peace? Today's program is Processing Grief Through Art. With us today to discuss this topic is our guest, Hannah Sherebrin. Hannah Sherebrin is the retired director of the Art Craft Studio of the University of Western Ontario, Canada. She moved to Israel in 1997, where she continues to work as an art therapist in private practice, dealing mainly with trauma, bereavement, and depression with adult populations. She supervises practicum students and other art therapists, and leads art therapy support groups of bereaved parents whose children have died in terrorist activities and in the army. Hannah has presented in numerous international and national conferences in Canada, Israel, and the United States, published articles in magazines and book chapters, served on the executive committee of the Ontario Art Therapy Association. Hannah resides both in Israel and in Canada. Now she is the immediate past president of the Israeli Art Therapy Association and member of the overseeing committee. Also, she is chair of the registration and supervision in the Ontario Art Therapy Association. Hannah, I cannot tell you how happy I am to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me on the program, and uh, I'm ready to uh, hear what you would like to what you would like me to talk about. Well, the first thing I think we need to know more about you. So please tell me about your brother. Well, my brother was uh, 12 years older than me, and uh, by the time I was born. My sister, who is um, 15 years older than me, already left um, the where we were. We I was born in Transylvania, which uh, during the Second World War, and um, as uh, you probably know, that was not a very um, easy place to be for a Jewish uh, person. I can imagine. Uh, and my sister left actually uh, a day before the Romania, which uh, Transylvania was part of Romania at that time, went into uh, came into the war. So um, she left with a youth movement, with Youth Aliyah, to Israel. And uh, my parents uh, didn't hear from her for probably over a year. They didn't know, had she arrived, had she not arrived, what was happening with her. In the meantime, I was born, and uh, the situation there was not that great. Uh, I knew my brother, I knew my sister only from pictures that were shown to me that that is your sister, and that's it. I mean, um, then in uh, 44, still during the war, we managed, uh, my father was in a work camp uh, and managed to get home uh, quite sick, and my mother said that they were both uh, very much uh, um, involved in the Zionist movement. And my mother said, I'm taking the kids and I'm going to Israel uh, by hook and by crook. I'm leaving here. If you uh-huh. want to come with us, that's fine. If not, you know, uh, be my guest, stay here, but I'm not staying. And they managed to get onto a little boat. Um, it was very lucky that my father was actually on the boat because he uh, understood Turkish and the um, the crew was talking to each other and telling them uh, telling that the boat will be given to the uh, Germans the next day. Oh. And uh, he got together the young people that were on the boat. My brother was. Uh, I guess about, um, what, 15 or almost 16 at the time. There were other young people. They managed to go and convince the, with, 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 uh, uh, with some money and with a gun, uh, convince the captain to change course. And uh, instead of being 
about um, you know two days or three days uh, on the boat. We were about two and a half weeks. No water, no food. Uh, people, many, many more people than the boat could actually uh, take. Um, and we somehow managed to uh, skirt the Bulgarian coast and get to Turkey. Uh, at Turkey, we were met. We were put uh, we, by the by the Haganah people. We were put on a tr- on a train that la- went through. Um, Syria, Lebanon, and um, came in um, at uh, what was then called Rasel Nakura, which is Rosh Uh, Nikra. And the the British then that were the mandate in in Palestine uh, put us on on lorries and took us to Atlit, which is like a a DP camp. My brother was there, but but we were separated. Men and women and children were separated. I met my my sister there for the first time b- uh, after the bur- barbed wires. Fans saw her and uh, didn't recognize her because she cut her hair. To cut a, a story long story short, we were all dispersed. My brother went to a kibbutz. My sister was uh, establishing a kibbutz. Um, and uh, from the kibbutz, uh, he went with the Palmach. He, he joined the Palmach. And uh, he was fighting in the War of Independence. And he was in many of the fights. He came home. I Last time I met him, he came home after a big battle. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was the first time that he actually talked uh, a lot. And uh, he was my my whole life. I mean, he was my support system. He was mm-hmm. my my only brother because that's that's the one that I grew up with that I knew. And uh, and after that, he went back to the army, and that was the last time I actually saw him. He fell. Uh, he was killed at the in the morning of the big armistice. We didn't know about it. Apparently, there was a. Um, it was in Tarshicha. Uh, and uh, they were they were surrounded. Um, he and the 10 people in his group stayed to let the others go. And all 10 of them uh, were killed and, and, and uh, were not allowed. Nobody was allowed to touch the, the, the bodies uh, until there was negotiation about 10 days later. Uh, they allowed to take the bodies out. And the way I learned about it, I was about uh, seven years old, uh, almost seven years old. And I went, I thought that he's coming home for the weekend. And I went, we cleaned the house and I went and I picked some flowers. And uh, and I came home and one of the kids said to me, "Um, go home, your parents are sitting on the floor. When I came in, um, it was a small, small, very, fairly small house. It was full of people. The people parted, and I saw there my father and mother, indeed, sitting on the floor. And my father looked at me and yelled, "You have no brother anymore." That was my introduction to grief. And I'm really sorry. I want to clarify something for people who may not to be able to relate to this. Uh, when you lose somebody in war, specifically to a war that creates the place in which you live, right? This is the war for independence. Right? Then every day, every place really has to remind you of that loss. Am I right? It's a complex thing because when mm-hmm. you come into a country, into a place, it's already a loss because you come from a different place. Mm-hmm. You lost your your first being, but like any immigrant that mm-hmm. comes into a new country, you already are struggling with a loss. Yeah, so true. it's kind of a loss on top of a loss. And you're starting to establish yourself with all the losses and you're trying to really create something and create something new. Yes, the personal loss does come into effect. And I remember myself walking on the street 
and seeing somebody from the back that I was absolutely sure looked like my brother. Oh, my. And my heart starts beating and you know sure. all your adrenaline starts flowing and you start yeah. really, as this is what happens because um, you start ventilating, you start really the whole thing, the whole emotional um, being in you starts, starts beating uh, and, and then you go and of course uh, it's not. It says here in your bio that you moved to Israel in 97, but you actually moved to Israel before there was an Israel in, I'm guessing, oh, 45, yes. 46. 44. And, but you also now live half of your time in Canada. So your relationship with, with Israel, I think, is complex. Very Are complex. You, and I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of this has to do with those early experiences and how difficult it was to come here and to sort of make a new life and then have it upturned from the beginning. Well, um, yes, but really that was that was at least making life, uh, getting away from death and coming into life. And with when you when you when you get away from death from from the from the Holocaust, and and you come back and you establish your life, you you of course take things with you, but but you put all your energy into creating something new, okay? So you put together the shards, you put together the things, and you start creating something new. Now, that thing blows apart again when you have another loss. Right. And this is this is what happens. And then you have to put all your energy in and so on and so forth to put things together and especially when you're when your when your support systems around you like your parents are the your main support systems they grieve too right and they don't have the energy or the time to kind of put in you and right. and and um and look after you and this is what I will tell you later about my work with the uh, with with bereaved parents, because I know it from the from the point of view and the perspective of the child. But I've also seen my parents, you know, and what they went through for their grieving. So I was doing things in different ways. I used to bury myself in books. I used to climb trees and sit on trees and read and and kind of close myself in and disappear, really. So you have to look at that kind of thing as well. Night Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. Hi, my name is Jamie Alcroft, and I just published my new book, The Tin Man Diaries. It's an amazing story of my sudden change of heart as I went through a heart and liver transplant. I can think of no better way to read The Tin Man Diaries than to cuddle up in your favorite Hearts Unite the Globe sweatshirt and your favorite hot beverage, of course, in your Hearts Unite the Globe mug, both of which are available at the Hug Podcast Network online store, or visit heartsunitetheglobe.org. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Michael. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on Michael's program, please email him at michael at hearttoheartwithmichael.com. Now, back to our program. Kana, tell me about what you do with people grieving with crayons. Tell me about the crayons, because that's special. Well, um, what I do is I actually ask people, uh, what is loss? What is trauma? Okay. And people talk about trauma in different ways. They tell me what people feel, what people do, whatever, whatever. 
And then what I do is I take a big, a, you know, a box of crayons and I open it up and I say, look at those. It's organized in here, whatever the colors, it doesn't matter where they are, how they are, but, but it's in the box. It's fine. It looks okay. And that's like, and then what I do is I take my hand and I give a big bang from the bottom. <laughs> and everything flies and and that is really and people have different reactions and the reactions that people have are the same reactions that we all have for uh, trauma sure. there is there is the the fight the flight the freeze you know people yeah. are um, either, getting up immediately and trying to get things together or they are they're they're kind of uh, moving back or, or they're freezing they're frozen to the to the point and then after a little bit it's it's you know they start putting things together back in the box that and amazes me i that, look that at part amazes box. me that people get up in the middle and just start putting it back I, you told me that in the pre-interview. I but, gotta make but it. But they, but they do because what is happening? You see the things on the floor, right. and you realize because I don't do anything. I just sit there, <laughs> and they take and they put it back into the box, and they're even looking if they see that there is a space in the box. They look around, and sometimes I look around and I point at something that over there. Let's see, uh, I can see one over there, and they pick it up and put it in the box, and and they're very upset if they don't find if they see that there is a space and they cannot see any more crayons, and we 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 actually look around and. Once they find it, they're quite happy and they put it back and it's in. And I look at it and I tell them, I look at them and say, would you, um, is this okay? Does it look fine now? Would you like to change some things in here? You can, you can, if, if it doesn't feel right to you, you can take some crayons and put them in different places and so on. And once they finish that, some, some people do, some people don't. I say, okay, is it fine now? And they say, yeah, fine. And I say, is it the same as it was before? And they say, obviously, no, it's, 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 it's not. I, I don't think so. I don't know, really. Mm. And I say, no, it can never be exactly the same as it was before. And that's all it is. Really, it is a metaphor for all that we do, in fact, in our grief work. Because Absolutely. what happens is we have a trauma. A trauma is like opening everything. Nothing stays the same. Everything is open. Everything is broken up. People are saying, my heart is broken. Right. My, my whole insides are mixed up. And that's what it is, in fact, it, it is a good reflection of what exactly it is. Because what happens in our trauma, everything that was, you know, at, at an equilibrium, and suddenly something comes and, and destroys this whole thing, destroys our equilibrium, really. And so what we need to do is start picking up the pieces and putting them back together. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do. Now, how we put it together, each one does it in their individual way. We don't know. But the, the idea is to help people put it together their own way so that they can live with it. It will never be the same as before because it's not because we integrate it somehow into our life. And how we integrate it, each one does it its own way. I was five hours old when I had my first surgery. Wow. The only advice I can really give someone like that is to be there for your family. This is life and you have two choices. You either live it or you sit in a corner and cry. I am Anna Jaworski and the host of Heart to Heart with Anna. Join us on Tuesdays at noon Eastern Time on Spreaker, our blog talk radio. We'll cover topics of importance for the congenital heart defect community. Remember, my friends, you are not alone. 
If you've enjoyed listening to this program, please visit our website, heartsunitetheglobe.org, and make a contribution. This program is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to educate, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at congenitalheartdefects.com. For information about CHD, hospitals that treat CHD survivors, summer camps for CHD families, and much, much more. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Michael. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our program, please send an email to Michael Lieben at michael at hearttoheartwithmichael.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Michael. Tell me about the black construction papers. How does that work? I use art materials and, and, and things that, that will work because I find that that words and the, the, the group members were, have also said that quite often support groups, you, st- you tell the story again and again and again and again and you ruminate. And what mm. happens is you're creating a loop and you stay within the loop and you cannot separate yourself from the loop. So when you're working with art materials, you actually talk about the stuff you are doing. You you separate yourself in a way, you distance yourself, okay. and you talk about that, you know, that drawing, that thing that I'm doing, and whatever, and you don't, it's, 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 it's as if you're not really talking about your own feelings or your own thing, you're talking about the... Um, the product and it's the, the, the actual work, the actual creation um, does actually do some things, some very important thing that you also get calmed. Your, all the thoughts and the talk and the noise in your head calms down. And then there is a different way of of communicating between the people. You're talking about working with black. You take a big uh, piece of like construction paper mm-hmm. and uh, ask them to work just from that to do some three-dimensional objects and to, if they want, use some color and anything else, use their, their whatever. One of the group was, I, I was absolutely amazed. He made a, a cube, mm-hmm. like, like one of these uh, origami cubes, but in yeah. big, mm-hmm. and went to the, to the um, tap and filled it with water uh-huh. and put it on the table and said, one of these days, it's going to collapse Right, right. Sure. Well, and the water is going to come out. Well, his wife took some black construction paper and made it as like like tore it and put some some colors on it and it made it like a branch of 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 a tree and stuck it in the middle because there was a hole in the middle. Stuck it in the middle and That's said, nice. now. It's going to feed the water, is going to feed right. this branch, and it's going to grow and it's not going to explode. This, it is absolutely wonderful. It's amazing, but is, is, there, is there anything that, 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 because it's black, that has anything to do with it, or is it just. Yes, art? I think it does. We see black, we talk about, about darkness, and that's one of the reasons I'm asking people to actually create something, create from the black, okay? Mm -hmm. So use that stuff that you have, use that feeling, use that darkness and create from it. And one of the nicest pieces besides this piece that I've seen is one of the people rolled it up and created like like a tube, and right. looked through the tube and said, I can see light at the end of the tunnel. Right. 
And so this is the kind of things that happen when you're using art, when you're using materials. Being an art therapist and being really a trauma therapist, I know exactly what are the stages and what people are going through. And I, I devise the activities that I do with people according to their stages and what we do with, uh, with, with the materials. Well, I want to ask you something else completely different. We talked about art therapy as a catalyst, and you use both silence and witnessing as important tools when you're, when you're working with people. And I noticed that at the beginning when you talked about throwing the, uh, the crayons, you kind of sat there and didn't do anything to see what, what people would do. So how does, how does silence, how does witnessing help you here? I think that's very, witnessing is very, very important because um, if you do things on your own and nobody is there to see it, it's as if you say, what for? What am I doing? Nobody is here. Nobody sees Nobody acknowledges. So if you're there, if you're a witness, the witnessing is extremely, extremely important because that is as if I hear you, I'm here with you, I'm waiting for you. I'm not going to rush you. You take your time. And silence is very, very important because it says, I'm listening, mm-hmm. and I'm, I can take it. I'm here with you. I'm here for you. I'm not running away. It's also very not judgmental. Yes, it is. That's, that's a very important point that you made. I mean, all of this is non-judgmental. The art is not in order to be... Uh, you know, to show how beautiful you can paint or how wonderful sure. your painting is or whatever. For it's sure. the process. For sure. It's, sure. it's a process. And it's the process that you go through both as a creator and as a creator of your own um, in, internal being, of your own um, balance and your own equilibrium back yeah, but, to your own but creating is something that that your client would do but listening is something that you would do uh, yes creating comes from them listening comes from me but i'm not just listening i'm there witnessing and when i see that the person needs something i'm there to provide it kind of this is an amazing story and we're going to continue this in our next program so this, for the moment, concludes this current episode of Heart to Art with Michael. And I want to thank Hannah Sherebrin for sharing her life and her passion for art with us. Hannah, thank you so much for being with us. And I, I'm looking forward to our next episode. Please join us at the beginning of the month for a brand new podcast. I'll talk with you soon. And until then, please remember, moving forward is not moving away. Thank you again for joining us. We hope you have gained strength from listening to our program. Heart to Heart with Michael can be heard every Thursday at noon Eastern Time. We'll talk again next time when we'll share more stories. We'd like to thank our patrons, Brenda Vignaroli, Joseph and Frank Jaworski. And you too can be a patron of our program by joining us on Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N, Patreon. Just go to www.patreon.com slash heart to heart. And there you can join and become a Patreon of Heart to Heart with Michael.